<laughs> uh, so it's really nice to be back here across campus, nice to be here in Pasadena that has treated me so well for so long. Um, as, uh, as was just mentioned, uh, MetaBasin was the first startup funded by the Caltech Art Center Design Accelerator. Uh, I was a grad student at Art Center when I left to start that venture. Three years later, we just closed a $3 million round of funding last May. Um, have raised close to four and are well on our way. But in addition to talking about MetaMason and 3D printed medical devices, I'm here to talk to you about some of the trends happening in 3D technology in general and how those trends affect how we think about design and how we execute on design. Because some of the norms that have been in place for you know, hundreds of years have recently kind of been obsoleted, but not everyone noticed. So uh, a little bit, uh, just a few notes on myself and my background. Uh, as, uh, as was mentioned, I started 3D modeling when I was 12 years old at, uh, in 1993. And by the time I was in high school, I was interning for different architecture firms. And uh, they were having me model these buildings they were making so that they could 3D print them out. And this is, you know, in the late 90s when 3D printing was completely unheard of. But if you were, you know, a team of architects, it was cheaper to pay $20,000 to have a model printed that was this big than it was to have your entire firm sitting around like glued together in a wooden glue. And so, you know, I went to architecture school after that, not because I wanted to be an architect, but that was the only way I knew how to keep playing around with 3D printers. Um, years later, I ended up working for a firm in Oakland called Performance Structures Inc., where I used to build and design giant robots which would make huge sculptures for famous artists. Uh, like Jeff Koons and Anish Kapoor. Uh, the Bean in Chicago was one of the first projects that uh, I kind of cut my teeth on as it sort of wrapping up right as I was getting started. And after spending a few years there having a lot of fun, uh, I came here to Pasadena to start MetaMason, uh, or I'm sorry, to go to grad school at Art Center, but with the concept uh, for MetaMason in mind uh, when I got there. And so, uh, so a little bit more about my personal history and why I'm doing what I'm doing. So the, the man on the far left of the screen, that's my grandfather, Dr. Robert Greenblatt, who is the inventor of the sequential birth control pill. And that is quite a legacy to try to live up to, and I'm still trying to beat him. And uh, funny that, because he was the dean at the Medical College of Georgia, and the two guys standing next to me in this very blurry photo that's from like 2009, so camera phones went I could then, uh, that, those are two very good friends of mine, an ENT and an orthodontist that went to med school at Medical College of Georgia years after my grandfather had passed away, but he had a library there. Um, and so they knew who he was, and I thought that was cool, and actually the day this photo was taken, in the summer of 2009, was when we were all kind of drunkenly having an argument about these masks they couldn't get their patients to wear in the hospital they were at. And I was like, guys, just 3D scan and 3D print, like 3D scan their faces and 3D print the masks. Like, like, you can do it, it's not that hard. And they're like, well, if you did that, you'd be rich. You'd probably be one of the richest people in the world. And I was like, huh, maybe I should stop playing around with robots and go to grad school. Uh, and so that's how I ended up here in Pasadena. Um, since then, uh, just a, a few notes about some of MetaMason's other sponsors that I think are important. So in addition to Caltech and Art Center, uh, we have manufacturing relationships with 3D systems and EOS that I'll talk more about in just a moment. And we were the most recently accepted company into the Singularity University Labs program, which is something we're quite proud of. So uh, let's talk about 3D printing, because you know, it gets a lot of hype, and I think that's why a lot of you guys are here to hear more about that. So you know, everybody is predicting a sea change in manufacturing, which is kind of ongoing. The printing sector expected to grow to about 20 plus billion dollars in the next couple of years. And this is being driven by a couple of things. Number one, printers keep getting faster and they keep getting cheaper. And that means the margins on printed parts go up exponentially over time. And so it's a really good place to get into now before uh, we meet the elbow in that curve. And then if you look at where the dollars in printing are really being spent, there are two places predominantly. One is in the aerospace industry, where you can make parts a lot lighter by weight and save a lot of fuel. But the other is in medicine, where things need to be very, very specific to the, to the patients that they're for. And we'll talk a lot about that momentarily. So, uh, the best-selling 3D printed product in the world is Invisalign braces, so bar none, hands down. A lot of people don't know that Invisalign is 3D printed um, because they take vacuum-formed plastic and they suck it down over printed tooling. And so they're indirectly printed, and that's one of the key things that people often miss with how to uh, utilize 3D printers and take advantage of what they, uh, their capabilities are. 
sometimes it's not trying to print out the final thing you're trying to make, but using it as a part of the manufacturing process to make some process much, much cheaper or far more easy to customize. Um, another printed product that's done very well is hearing aids. Most people don't know that 90% of all of the world's hearing aids are 3D printed. And then, you know, right now in the medical space, we're seeing a lot of other printed products coming to market and doing quite well. Uh, custom orthotics being one of them. Uh, we'll talk more about Souls in a bit, but full disclosure, the CEO of Souls, which is a printed orthotics company, is one of my Mason's advisors, so I try to uh, plug her or wherever possible. Um, so let's talk about some things that we're 3D printing right now that most people didn't realize that we could. So late, earlier this summer, this is a spine replacement that was actually implanted into a patient in China. It's a titanium spine that went into a patient that had deformed vertebrae, so that, that was pretty interesting. Um, prosthetics have been growing in popularity and large margin, and now we're starting to see them get lighter and cheaper, and um, even more functional than they were before, and so that's another great application of medical printing technology. Um, one, of my, one of my new favorites is uh, a doctor named Dr. Jeremy Mao. Um, this is pretty trippy. This is where the cutting edge of medical printing technology is right now. So what uh, Dr. Mao figured out how to do was to print uh, cartilage for implantation uh, within a body. But he doesn't actually print the cartilage. He prints a scaffold of special plastic that recruits the right kind of cells once it goes into the body that it's been uh, designed for. So he knows what kind of food the special cells in the body want in order to put cartilage there. So he puts that into the body, and the body builds the cartilage in the right place. And so that's another really interesting indirect printing method where you're not printing the end goal, but you're printing a process to get to the end goal. Uh, he's currently done this successfully in 10 sheep. I'm waiting for him to start doing it in human patients so I can get my knees replaced because my snowboarding career would like that a lot. Um, then uh, on the, on the a more uh, creative thinking side of things are, are scoliosis braces that we're starting to see. And these are products that need to be both fashionable, intimate, but also have a, a very clear purpose within the healthcare space. And so these are examples of scoliosis brace that can be worn under the clothes so that the patient, especially if it's a female patient, doesn't need to feel self-conscious or you know, ugly because they're wearing something that they need to correct their body. And so one of the things that printing can really enable is a deeper psychological connection to our medical devices. And I think that you know, that's one of the underrated areas of quality of care is the amount that psychology and design can really improve things. So, you know, we're doing bones, we're doing prosthetics. Uh, something I didn't mention that's also super interesting are what are called 4D printed parts. These are parts that are made out of materials that will grow with the body in different ways. In this case, that's an airway stent. It's a spring that was implanted into a newborn that had a collapsed airway, but that spring will put just the amount of right amount of pressure to keep the airway propped open as that child grows, continuing to push outward pressure on the airway stent. And you know, so like the uh, the applications are getting more and more interesting all the time. But you know, the, the issue is that we're not getting enough of them because not enough people are thinking about the technology in the right way. And uh, that's sort of the next part of my talk will uh, focus on. So we stop getting this. <laughs> uh, this is what most people think about when they think about 3D printing. They think about worthless tchotchkes and uh, cute toys. And so we're taking all of the technology that could be used to completely change the face of humanity and we're turning it into kind of worthless toy makers and that's very, very depressing. Um, so let's stop doing that and uh, instead start thinking a little bit differently about what does this technology mean? What does it mean you can produce things on demand? Well, in our old mass production based economy, you know, we are highly dependent on factories producing a lot of parts that we then send to warehouses and then distribute. Um, this model has a large carbon footprint, it takes a long time, it means very, very long product cycles, and you know, it, it, it doesn't, it's not all bad. If without the Industrial Revolution, we would never have gotten cheap products. You know, like I wouldn't have this watch, these clothes, these shoes, you know, not all the stuff that we enjoy, we enjoy because mass production made it cheap. But in the process of making things cheap, it sacrificed a tremendous amount on design. Specifically, people do not come in standard sizes. Nobody's small, medium, or large. Everybody comes in a wide variety of sizes, but mass production can't really cater to that. You know, it really needs to churn out a lot of the same things. And you know, we're, we're kind of 
reaching the logical conclusion of you know, how efficient and how good that design can be, because we're not really designing the most good for anyone, we're just designing the least tolerable bad, which is sort of a, sort of a crappy approach to design, if you ask me. And so, how do we change our thinking about what design is and how to improve it on an individualized basis? Uh, and, and my company, MetaMason, we call this concept scan fit print, which is really central to our business model. But if we take a more philosophical approach to this, uh, we get what I call the three I's, which are input, interface, and instantiate. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that uh, right now. Uh, but, or actually, before I do, let me, let me qualify it. So I want to take a look at the, the history and roots of modernism as we know it. So modernism, this concept that governs, governs post-industrial revolution design, really comes out of these three guys who you've probably heard of before. It's Van der Rohe, the Corbusier, and Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, you know, very famous architects, very famous product designers around the turn of the century. But what we may or may not know about them is they all have the same mentor and the same teacher who they all worked for and interned for at different periods of time. A guy named Walter Gropius, who in addition to starting the Bauhaus uh, and Harvard Architecture School, is kind of credited as being the father of modernism as we know it. And so, you know, where did this idea come from? And the ideas of modernism mostly came from modern technology that were being really well understood by Walter Gropius himself. And around, you know, 1900, 1910, when he was starting to really, you know, uh, cook with some of these design techniques, that was reinforced concrete and steel, which had never been built with before. And so using reinforced concrete and steel, he was able to do things that seemed physically impossible. And you know, his students took these techniques and then kind of perfected them into a craft, and you know, we got the birth of modernism. But really what all those buildings are doing is they're showcasing the structural properties of this new construction technique and you know, there's an interplay there between the design and the technology the, which are enabling each other. So now, here we are in you know, the, the modern current world, and it's not reinforced steel and concrete that are new, it's 3D printers. But it's not just 3D printers, it's 3D scanners and this thing you know, known as cloud computing, which is really the ability to do phenomenally complex computing tasks that used to be very time consuming, very expensive, near instantaneously and quite cheaply. And so that changes a lot about how we take a design tack to embrace these, uh, these tools we now have at our disposal. And so um, these things are getting really ubiquitous. Um, this, uh, the, the helmet you see on your left is an LA-based company called Dacry. That's a construction helmet with an augmented reality display so it can tell construction workers what they're supposed to do on the job site. This is a really effective means of using augmented reality to make a series of paths a lot more efficient. Um, the phone that's next to it, that's the Lenovo Fab 2, which is launching, I think, this month. It's got a built-in 3D scanner. So we're now starting to see phones with onboard scanners hitting the market at commercially acceptable prices. And in addition to being great for VR and AR, um, devices like this will be really good for mass customization. Um, now let's talk about uh, cloud computing and what are some of the things that that makes possible. So. Uh, the air print, airplane bracket you see here is the one that's called topologically optimized. That means a simulation was run on this part that loaded it with the load it was going to be on, or be under, and the algorithm said what material needs to be here to do this job, and what material doesn't need to be here to do this job. And iterating and iterating thousands of times running the simulation over and over again, it says actually the parts can be a lot more efficient, strictly weight wise, if it if you take all this material away. And if you're an airline, every pound you move from the design, removed from the design of an airplane equals millions of dollars of fuel cost saved per year. And so that's a very, very useful way to apply a cloud computing technique to you know, improving the parts in our lives. Uh, additionally, let me just sum a few bars about things that we can 3D print now that most people didn't know that we could 3D print. So uh, the cubes that are multicolored on the one side of the screen, that's sugar from a company that was originally born here in LA called Sugar Labs, and they're starting to launch right now, that they're not open yet, they're opening soon, a series of 3D printed, basically candy shops, where people can create and eat uh, custom 3D printed sugar candy. Uh, in the middle is a construction project that's going on in China right now for 3D printed concrete. We are now 3D printing buildings. 
And then, uh, this will really blow your mind, the, the thing on the, uh, the, the pink blob there, that is a 3D printed ovary that was successfully implanted into a mouse that, uh, that um, produced an egg that uh, was fertilized and then later produced a mouse. Um, so um, we, we can now print you know, cell tissue at that level, uh, that, that advanced level. And so you know, the technology is really outpacing what a lot of people think it's capable of. So what does all of this scanning and cloud computing and printing mean for how we apply it today with, like in, in the context of modern design? Well, uh, number one, it means that we can do products that are now on demand. If a product is manufactured on demand, that means you didn't have to warehouse it beforehand. You don't have to store it in inventory. You don't have to discount it if it didn't sell. Your materials can stay a commodity until the time of manufacturing, so your capital structure is completely different. And I suppose I'm living and breathing proof that this means you can start a company for a lot less than it used to take to get a hardware-based product to market. So what this means for the greater context of you know, contemporary society is that we're about to see happen in manufacturing what we just saw happen to food, which is a massive movement toward localism. This means that you know, the products that we are buying on a regular basis instead of coming from factories in China or Vietnam will be made you know, somewhere that's not too far away from us and not made until after we've purchased them and you know, we wait our two days via Amazon Prime and then bam, there it is, like what do we care? So uh, you know, 3D printing often also gets blown out of proportion that you know, we're, we're heading toward Star Trek and you know, replicators and whatnot. And the technology is a lot more limited than that. You know, it's not magic, uh, but it's a whole lot better than mass producing things the way that we are right now. And so like that uh, assembly line, um, that looks like hell to me. It's pretty sad, and guess what? That's the assembly line where the iPhone is made. Um, even the most advanced pieces of technology that we have are still coming from kind of arcane means of production. That's, that's sad and depressing. But for all the cool credit we give 3D printing, it also sucks at the same time. Um, the technology itself is still in its infancy for the large part. And these machines have really high failure rates and they are wildly inconsistent and they take a lot of tender, loving care to master and get them to behave. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Jeff Kowalski at a conference that I was also speaking at was kind of talking about how printing is going through the middle of this trough of disillusion. And in the course of the past 18 months, we've seen the entire consumer 3D printing side of things kind of burst um, because people are trying to push it out a little too quickly. But at the same time, things on the industrial side um, have never looked better. And so, you know, there's, there's an interesting schism going on between those people who can really master the technology and those people who are trying to push it a little prematurely. Now, um, one of the things that gets talked about is this kind of magical killer app that's supposed to make 3D printing really, really useful for everybody, really valuable, and it's waiting for this moment where it uh, kind of loops out of the shadows. Uh, one of the reasons why that's not happening right now is that the only people, sort of like myself, who have this mastery are kind of the homebrew computer club of the printing era. Those of us who are geeky about it are really, really, really geeky about it. And we are willing to put up with the machines for how difficult they are, even though it is, they are you know, largely cryptic to use. Uh, for, for anybody who doesn't know, this is the Altair. Uh, it was the first uh, consumer available computer. Uh, it happened in like the late 70s. It was clearly a little before even my time. But you know, it's it's still kind of representative of what computing was before it became approachable to everybody else, and so that's kind of that magical killer app that we need right now is that thing that's going to make printing accessible to everyone, and approachable and useful, and we've kind of seen what that looks like via Hollywood in the form of Jarvis, who is Iron Man's you know computerized buddy. Uh, Tony Stark, at no point in the majority of the Iron Man movies, actually designs anything. He just tells Jarvis to make it, and Jarvis figures it out, and he's like, great, this is what I wanted, awesome. Um, I, I wish I had a Jarvis, I bet you guys all did too. But, you know, in this image, on the one hand, he's 3D scanning and holographically visualizing this armature that he wants to produce, and then a few days later, you know, later in the montage, bam, there it is, perfectly machined, ready to fit, ready to function. And so that is kind of um, the, what we need right now, but we've seen a similar point in technology history where you know, that's what was needed and that's what we got. So if we go back to the desktop publishing revolution, K 
most people point to is the birth of modern tech. You know, before we had Macintoshes that we loved, we had PCs and laser printers and fax machines that were all absolutely horrible. And we put up with them for a long time, and they were really difficult to use, and getting the one machine to work with the other machine took a rocket scientist, but we didn't anyway. And then came Microsoft and Adobe, and they made it easy. Nobody started, everybody stopped thinking about the hardware, they stopped thinking about the actual technology, and they just thought about the content. They just thought about what it is they wanted to make, not the tools that were, had to be navigated in order to make it. And that's exactly what printing kind of needs right now, these sort of enabling tools. And in the medical space, we actually have them. Uh, there are two great software packages in the medical world right now. One's called Magix, and the other is called Medical Modeling. And what they do is they take MRI data and CT scan data, and if you need a skull plate, for example, or a, another implanted bone, they're gonna, they take that scan data and they figure it out for the physician so that you can make those printed parts quite easily. Um, but you know, these pipelines that we're using within you know, the implanted medical world can be lifted out of that, learned from, and you know, applied to other applications. And so this is that sort of three-part uh, input interface instantiate coming back up again. And what that really means is data collection on the input side, whether that's a 3D scan or an MRI or an X-ray or any other form of data that you can kind of collect and digitize. Then a intuitive interface to, to do stuff with that data, to you know, give it purpose, to give it function, no more than is necessary though. You never want to overwhelm that user. You just want to give them what it is that you need to ask them so that they can make those, those decisions without getting bogged down and then instantiate it, which is just a fancy word to make it real. So I'm gonna take a look at three, uh, three case studies. Uh, the first is Kegan Schoenberg. Um, she's the CEO of Souls, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, the second are two designers, Jessica Rosenkrantz and Justin Rosenberg, who are huge inspirations to me and phenomenal, phenomenal creatives. And then Siavash Madhavi, who is another mentor and um, amazing engineer. So uh, the, each of these have uh, three companies, Nervous System, Souls, and then Technologies, that do really phenomenal things that kind of take this sort of three-stage approach. Uh, for Souls, that's an orthotic where they have an iPhone app that you take a whole bunch of photos of your foot, and they interpret that data to create a custom orthotic and then sell you for 99 bucks and it shows up your door personally customized uh, your insole. And they run all of the kinematic simulations to make sure that that's gonna improve your posture and your gait based on your height, your weight, the kind of shoes you wear. Um, so that's a pretty innovative approach to making a better insole. Uh, Jessica and Jesse, their company Nervous Systems, makes customizers for a lot of the different 3D printing service bureaus so that non-designers can make custom designed things. So that particular customizer is to make necklaces where all you have to do is pull a couple little sliders around and this really complex geometry will grow and move and you don't have to be an art center uh, graduate to be able to do it, you just have to be bored and want to make your girlfriend something cool. Um, or your boyfriend or I didn't mean to be uh, uh, you know, gender biased. Um, but that said, uh, within Technologies is a simulation company that does really, Autodesk bought them last summer for I think it was 80 million. And uh, what you're looking at, that big metal honeycomb thing in the bottom of the screen, that's a heat exchanger. But it was not a heat exchanger that was designed by people, it was designed by algorithms. They said, take stainless, printable stainless steel, we want to pass this much water through it, and cool it at this much of a rate, go. And the algorithm figured out, actually, based on how the thermal transfer is going to work, this is the geometry that will do that. And so that was you know, a, a perfect radiator key exchanger designed not by humans, but by algorithms. And so you know, like, these are all great, great, great examples of you know, how this technology can be useful. We're going to switch gears back to medical uh, for no other reason so that I can plug my company and tell you guys about what I do. Um, but you know, just reminding you guys that 3D printed products for the human face and head are the two biggest sellers within the 3D printed market space by, uh, by a pretty large margin. And so enter MetaMason and the world's first custom printed respiratory mask to treat sleep apnea. Uh, so this is for CPAP therapy. So uh, traditional CPAP masks are pretty hard. Uh, they're actually one of the most hated treatments of all modern medicine. And this is amazing for something that has $4 billion a year in sales and um, affects you know, 
anybody you know who snores badly has early stage sleep apnea, and by the time they're in their mid to late 40s, it's gonna be pretty bad, and if they don't do anything about it, they'll have twice the mortality rate of a pack-a-day smoker, or two pack-a-day smoker. Um, so, you know, like, this is kind of a nuisance for the entire planet. And it's a comorbidity with a whole raft of things. Heart disease, depression, diabetes, a lot of people who have erectile dysfunction actually just have sleep apnea, and if they just raise their pulse oxygen levels, they would be fine. Um, same thing with a lot of antidepressants and people who think they're depressed. They're just under-oxygenated. Their pulse oximetry is too low. So what sleep apnea is, is this is, this is a healthy airway of you know, somebody who's like in their 20s. Over time, you know, it starts to sink and sag just like everything else on our bodies. When you snore, it vibrates. Over time, when you get older, it starts to connect with the other wall. And when you hear that, that popping noise when you touch somebody snoring, that is an apnea. It's not like a it's not a it's not a disease per se so much as a, the physical event that happens when one side of the airway touches the other side of the airway. But when that happens, cortisol and adrenaline just coursing through the bloodstream to get that gasp and that popping sound. Well, that's happening 50 to 200 times a night in somebody who has severe sleep apnea. So no wonder it makes you know all of their body kind of go haywire in various ways. And you know not only does it cause serious health risk, but it has people walking around tired all day, and you know, in areas like people who have like trucking logistics fleets or operate heavy machinery, this means like significantly higher fatality rates and you know things that require people to be alert and attentive all day. So we've got like secondary negative effects because of this disorder and the fact that half of all people who undergo CPAP therapy quit within the first six months of use, and then of the ones who make it past that, about half of those quit. So you've got this just like horrible, horrible product because people's faces don't come in standard sizes. They're not even symmetrical. And the product means that, or this bad design leads to you know, abrasions and leakage, like you get air streaming across your face in the middle of the night, you wake up, you're like, oh my God, this is awful. Um, you know, it's, it's not hard to understand why people don't really like being like, treatment. And so this is just begging for a personalized solution. So at MetaMason, what we do is we take a tablet that has a 3D scanner attached to it. This is a Structure I.O. by a company called Excitable. It's like a $300 high resolution 3D scanner. Uh, we have the physician scan the patient in the doctor's office. It takes you know, about 10 seconds. And then we have an interface that we allow the patient and physician to generate you know, a custom mask that not only looks the way they want, but it fits the way they want. And it fits absolutely perfectly. Um, because not only are we fitting it to the exact contours of their face, but we're even fitting it to the exact contours of, the, of their nostrils. And so because we can trace each nostril exactly, we can go inside and put pressure on the outside of the nair instead of blowing into the septum, blowing away from the face, which just produces a far superior uh, ergonomic solution to this problem. And you know, it's you know, also significantly smaller, and more aesthetically attractive than the masks that are sort of available today. Within that creation process, we're also inviting the physician and the patient to work together on dialing those features in. And so this allows the physician to let the patient know what they think is important, let the patient tell the physician what they think is important, and then working together and communicating with one another, they can create something that for them specifically. And just like how you feel proud when you wear a tailored suit when you go out, what we want to do is create a product that doesn't make people feel like they're dying because they look like dark figures not Galapagos, but in fact feel really proud and good about what they're wearing to bed every night in a place that in an environment that's very intimate that you know like people need to feel confident, calm, and relaxed in order to be able to get good sleep. And so how does this algorithm do that? Uh, number one, we have to identify the landmarks on the face. So where are the eyeballs, where's the tip of the nose, where the shapes of the nostrils. What is that conformal surface that we need this to match? And then how do you control what that surface is? And then we have to identify each uh, nostril and create what we call those nasal fittings, allowing the patient and physician to control exactly how deep that goes and how thick those are. And then there's a pneumatic chamber that connects to this coupling, this hose. Um, so we want to make sure that that is as contoured as possible so we can reduce any turbulence in the airflow and maintain what's known as laminarity, which means that all, all the air is going the same direction. And that's important in this case because higher laminarity will mean 
that you were passing the same amount of pressure at a lower level of air velocity, which means that the machine will run quieter and the insides of the nostrils will get less irritated. And so this is just, you know, in real time, applying a little bit of physics and simulation to this product so that it is optimized for that individual uh, without anybody having to be an engineer in that process. And so um, that's my nose. It's very asymmetrical, but so is everybody else's. And that's really, that's really the, the point here is that, you know, like we have to embrace humans asymmetry, their uniqueness, in order to optimize both how and how we be designed for them. And so this is, you know, this is for Spear, or I'm sorry, we're changing the name. Um, the name is currently under debate, but this is our uh, custom CPAP mask that we'll be bringing to market next summer. We're launching our first clinicals mid next month, and then the second round of clinicals in November, and we'll be done with all of our FDA testing by year's end. Um, but uh, uh, let, me, let me speak to another thing about positioning and why did we go here. Um, you know, long before I decided that we were going to be a CPAP company, I did a really thorough market analysis of what needs customization and what can 3D printers do. Uh, and after studying what we could print and um, what was needed, I kind of noticed this giant gaping hole and what the capabilities were and what the, what the needs were. So we got really good at printing things that were rigid and not biocompatible. And we got okay at printing things that were flexible and not biocompatible. And then we got good at printing things that were rigid and biocompatible. But nobody cracked how to print something that was soft and biocompatible. And I was like, huh, that's where all the fun, that's where all the useful stuff should be. That's where all the stuff that's gonna wanna actually be in contact with the body should be. So we had to go and spend like two and a half years inventing how to actually make the manufacturing process. Um, that was really annoying, but it was worth it. Um, what we figure out to do is to 3D print a shell of what we want to make that is paper thin. That we then, and it has to be clear, it's paper, it's key. Uh, to print the shell, we inject it with silicone. Oh, shoot. Uh, <laughs> we throw it into a, a UV oven that both cures the silicone and weakens the shell. And when you pull that out, you can peel it open like a hard boiled egg. And what you get is something that's platinum medical grade silicone, just like every other medical product that's platinum medical grade silicone, but has all of the advantages of 3D printing. And so that's how metamodernism comes into practice for us. It's this scan fit print process of data in, customization, product out. But you know, it's our goal to not create just a CPAP company, but to create a greater platform for mass customization. You know, I, I hope in this process that you know our APIs get to a point where other companies and other people and other designers can start to leverage them to create other standard fit customized things. And you know, that's just to say that even within our own roadmap, uh, I, I'm spilling the beans about some of the things that we're thinking about. Uh, down the road, we're thinking about getting into everything from personalized nipple interfaces for breast pumps to pessaries, to cervical caps, to football pads, to military gear, anything that's soft that needs to fit the body in a very precise way, something that we can easily produce. And so, you know, the, the, the future is looking exciting. Um, and so with that said, I'll take any questions that you guys have, and, you know, thank you guys for listening to me proud. Any questions? Hold on. That was very uh, informative. Thank you. I grew up in the age of stereolithography. Yep. So how does this relate to that? So that's a great question for so many reasons. So number one, uh, stereolithography SLA was the first 3D printer ever invented, and it was invented here in LA. And LA does not get enough credit for being the birthplace of 3D printing. Technically, it was up in Valencia, but it's still LA County. Um, second, it was invented by a man named Chuck Hall, who started a company called 3D Systems. And 3D Systems is actually the same partner that printed this from an SLA machine. Um, except that machine is a lot bigger than the one that Chuck invented back in the mid 80s. Um, specifically, 3D Systems has a facility in Denver, Colorado that they opened at the beginning of the year. It's the largest 3D printing medical device facility in the world. And that's where um, they're knocking these out for us out of a 
big machine that's about half the size of this stage called a Pro X950 that can knock out about 100 of these in a 12 hour time span. Um, and that's, that's the short, short version. How is 3D printing evolved from the standard Sure, sure, sure. So, um, stereolithography, uh, which you asked about, is taking a, a resin tank, a big vat of liquid resin, and firing a laser into it that solidifies the resin as it hits the, as it hits it. And there's a platform underneath that either drops down or raises up depending on the orientation of the resin, the, the laser. And it writes a layer, and the platform moves a little bit. It writes a layer, and the platform moves a little bit. What has happened in the last 25 years is that that laser has started to move a lot, lot faster. And now there are beam splitters that can now split it up, so you can print multiple parts simultaneously. Uh, a child of SLA came along called DLP SLA, which is using a projector that's like literally exactly like this projector to do like layers at a time. Uh, there's a company called Carbon up in Palo Alto. They made a process called Clip, where they use ferromagnetic blowers, like the kind that like a Dyson vacuum or a Dyson fan uses to create a little bubble underneath the resin so that you can print it continuously and you don't have to do it layer by layer. You can kind of just draw it out gradually. And so there are lots of micro innovations within that category of printing. Um, there are five major categories of printing, and you know I can speak to them each for just a moment. Uh, another is called SLS, which stands for stereo, uh, Selective Laser Sintering, which works just like SLA, except instead of liquid resin, it's powder, and that powder can be metal. So it can be nylon or, or plastic. So you can use nylon, titanium, some of the steel, bronze. This is sintered bronze right here. Um, there's a, yet another process called multi-jetting, which is sort of a combination of the two, where you have like basically like a HP printhead that's got a bunch of powders and different kinds of binder that runs passes back and forth, dropping down particles of binder and material. Uh, you have what most people know of, which is called FDM, which is like a hot glue gun squirting <laughs> plastic, sort of like building up part layer after layer after layer. Uh, that's really good for multi-material stuff. As a multi-jet, where both SLA and SLS are totally single material. Um, and that, that's sort of your high level overview of the basic types of printing. There, there are other more nuances in some edge cases that I'm going to leave out right now, but um, there, there's a brief open for you. Uh, other questions? Oh, oh, no. So this is very interesting technology, and one of the advantages of 3D printing is that you know virtually anyone could do it as long as you have the equipment. So are you going? To I completely disagree with that premise. Not to be rude, but most printers are very difficult to use. They have really high failure rates, and they take a lot of tuning to get them to behave. And then once they're behaving, it's only a matter of time. Like you get like. <laughs> X number of prints before it starts to misbehave again. And God forbid, somewhere in that process, you decide to change the material that that printer was printing. Like, just even changing from one spaghetti strand of one kind of plastic to another can have catastrophic consequences and take a lot of tuning to get kind of dialed in again. Uh, the goal is certainly to make machines that are highly accessible for everyone, highly usable for everyone, but the past 18 month collapse in consumer printing has really shown that like that goal is not quite here yet. Well, uh, thank you for correcting me on that. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> so, so here's my question. Um, since this is supposed to be so customizable, um, do you intend to have with your company one factory that produces everything for everyone on the planet, or do you want to be deploying these at very specific locations so affecting the local population? Great question. So there's what I want and there's what I get. Uh, those two things are not exactly the same. So what I get right now is a 3D systems facility that's in Denver that happens to be written, relatively centered in the middle of the country. So it can mail stuff to the different corners of the country pretty easily. I would love it if there were like 10 more of those regionally. 
Um, but that's not gonna happen for a little while, especially because for, for our use case, we're talking about medical. And that means the facility has to be ISO certified and they have to have a lot of very particular uh, um, air processing and cleaning rooms and handling of material that makes it kind of tricky. Uh, there is another facility that we use from a different company that's in Ohio. Um, a lot of your old sort of rust belt manufacturing areas have kind of turned the corner and trying to reinvent themselves to be printing months right now, and it's certainly happening. Um, I think we're five or 10 years away from that kind of more regionalized network starting to emerge, and that's certainly optimal, but, you know, and we're, we're headed that way, but, but we're not there. Hi there. I was gonna do a plug for it. Homegrown manufacturer around here. D's Maker. Have you heard of D's Maker? I know D.A. Okay, D.A. Well. And uh, well, you kind of answered the question because he's recently moved from Pasadena to San Dimas, and I haven't been in touch with him. But uh, you kind of answered it a little bit. But for people that are starting and want to play and dabble in 3D, I think that's a good starting point. Um, so let me let me let me put a qualifier on something that I said earlier that I don't want to edit and modify. Um, there is a great ecosystem out there right now for hobbyists and enthusiasts and makers to be able to get into technology and do awesome things with it. What I'm really talking about is moving across the threshold from hobbyists and enthusiasts to non-designers, non-engineers, non-makers. Um, and I still think that you know we're a good five years away from that, that kind of being true from a technology perspective, but at the same time, just kind of like the early days of computing, there are really great avenues in for and that bar of sophistication keeps getting lower and lower and lower. So I don't want to disincentivize anybody from engaging with it. Uh, I'm just frustrated that it's not moving along at fast pace. Can you speak on this product? Uh, we'll talk offline about it after. Hey guys, uh, first of all, thank you for a fabulous presentation. Uh, this is probably one of the best presentations I've seen across camp or anywhere in Pasadena in the last couple of years. So I'm very, very impressed. And I'm, I'm accrediting that not just to your natural talent, but also to your absolute background. I have two questions for you. Uh, so the first one is about the role of design played in your successful development of your product. So I'm actually old enough to know 3D systems in 1995 when we used okay. it at Edge Design in Woodland Hills. That's where bullet holes uh, were in the windows once in a while. Um, and I remember how that revolutionized the way we did uh, product development because we could get cheap models really quick for actually practical testing, just to some extent. So I wonder if you could comment on how you see your design skills and, and your knowledge of design, especially from our of house design, to develop your product. The other one is, uh, you talk about customization. And the other issue is, of course, the transport thing. So we wrote an article a couple years ago about rapid prototyping. And one of the opportunities I saw, so please correct me if I'm wrong or if you see it differently, was that if you wanted to have multiple products available to medical staff in remote places, Africa, in wherever, you know, you could have them printed locally and then just used, maybe not controlled locally, but, but sent and printed and then with minimal assistance, you know, they could take care of that. Does that make sense to you or is that also 2020 something? So uh, I'll ask you the second question first, and then I'll switch back to, to the prior question. On medical printing in remote areas, mm -hmm. there's an awesome LA-based company run by a guy named Elliot Kotek called Not Impossible Labs. Um, they specifically take maker bots and other 3D printers to refugee areas in Africa and teach people there how to use the machines to make their own prosthetics and their own medical devices. There's no FEA insurance so there's no liability so in that use case that works just fine here where we have torts and insurance and an FDA and we like our medical products to work the first time out and we're going to sue someone if they don't it doesn't work so well um, just just uh, unpacking, uh, unpacking the details on that. Um, I know this quite well because the FDA just published its guidelines on 3D printed medical devices, which I was in the room to help write at FDA headquarters about 18 months ago. And one of the things that we debated ad nauseum was should we allow consumer printing within, into the medical space? What we decided after a really, really long debate um, was that it was not a good idea. 
and specifically because it would create a uh, legal quagmire. Um, because like, who do you sue? Do you sue the person who made the machine and designed the part? Do you sue yourself? Um, you know, like, and that within our medical landscape, it, it wouldn't make sense. Uh, on the role that design and art center played in metanation success in my approach, um, on the design strategy side, I'd say that the lessons that I learned in grad ID were invaluable about how to approach need finding, about understanding the difference between a blue ocean and a red ocean market environment, about how to um, message a market that has very different views. So physicians, patients, patient spouses, managed care networks versus uh, hospital systems, being able to see that landscape. I, I, and we've never been able to tackle it as gracefully as I think we have without that education. At the same time, a lot of the design technique skills that MetaMason has been built on were not things that I learned at Art Center. In fact, were things that I ran into a tremendous amount of resistance within Art Center for employing. And what I'm specifically talking about is a programming language known as Grasshopper. It's very common in the world of architecture and really hated in the world of product design. Um, product designers are taught to use SolidWorks and design things that are going to come through mass-produced processes. And this informs the entire way that they approach design, from sketching a whole shit ton in the beginning to not going digital until the end. This is wrong. <laughs> um, this, is, this, is, that, this is the antithesis of how to execute mass customization. Um, instead, what I would encourage people who are in the product design space to think about is going digital as soon as possible. And to set up a data model in which you were thinking about how is how am I sensing the user? How am I understanding the user? What are the user's needs? What are the user's wants? How can I parameterize those things? How can I funnel those into decisions in a curated process that are going to adapt to them? So the design is about the user's journey and their curation and their flow and programming around those needs in that process instead of the designer's ego and their identity and the thing that makes them you know, flashy, hot shit, fully start, blah, 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 blah. Um, that kind of post-postmodern thinking can go to hell in my opinion. It's, it's preventing us from focusing on people's needs because we're too busy trying to pimp ourselves out as talent. Um, and so the sooner we depart from that kind of mentality, and frankly the rest of our center does too, the better. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, great talk. Uh, two questions. Um, one, you have your the, the patients and the doctors kind of working together to customize things. I was wondering how often uh, there might be a, hey, I customized it in a way that I don't like. Is there a way to improve on this? And the second question I have uh, is uh, more on the sensing side. So you talked more about the, the printing. Sure. Um, but it, the structure sensor, is that adequate for you right now? Are there things that work and things that don't, things that you're looking for? Uh, so I, I need great, great, great questions. So on the doctor-patient uh, customization side, we're trying to figure that out right now. Um, like the actual clinical trials that we're currently running, in part are to find out how much control is too much control. What are the boundaries of these parameters that we are now giving people to play with? Um, as we iterate, we're finding out, no, no, too far. Uh, not enough. Uh, those two things don't go well together. So there's a lot of iteration that we have to do right now to kind of bug hunt. And as my chief design officer likes to say, figure out where the dead bodies are buried. Because um, there, there are a lot of mistakes that our system is still capable of. We're trying to go through the QA process of eliminating them. Uh, on, the, on the scanning side, uh, the structure I.O. is just barely capable of hitting the resolution that we want to get to. But for a $400 piece of hardware, that's pretty awesome, which is getting down to about 250 microns of resolution. Intel just released a new scanner that's 200 bucks called the RealSense SR300, which is almost as good as the structure and half its price. Um, there's a little war going on in scanning that we're watching right now, and the next wave of it should be hitting in about six months' time. Structure actually got funded their Series B by Intel, and they've got a new device called the Core that we're really waiting on um, that looks awesome. 
And then one of the reasons why that investment happened was because CrimeSense, that was this, the sensor company that made the sensor that's inside of the structure, was acquired by Apple two years ago. And so, is it iPhone 7 that has an onboard scanner, or is it iPhone 8? Uh, last I checked, Apple didn't acquire anybody that they didn't actually put into a product and take to market. It's just a matter of time. And so, um, my goal and MetaMason's goal is to get our product together and into the market before that happens. So, if anybody works for Apple, tell them to get eight. <laughs> uh, you don't want it yet. They're already. Um, but it's coming. It's coming really, really scary fast. And the Connect V2, which is the 3D scanner that's attached to the micro latest Microsoft Xbox, is actually phenomenally powerful, like scary powerful in terms of a piece of hardware. Did you did you add the eye from HAL to that image, by the way? That's that's not the actual appearance of the Connect 2. I just noticed that there's the eye from HAL. Did. I might have used a bad graphic. Yeah. There you yeah. Go. Oh, somebody threw it on there. Yeah. That's that's how. That's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's totally not how. actually on the Yeah, no, no, no. Like um, one of my, one of my uh, one of my employees might even be breaking right now. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, I know that there were jokes about the fact that the sensor itself could see people's heartbeat through their skin and their respiratory and their temperature, and because of that, it can actually detect what your emotions are at any given time. So there was sort of a big brother thing having this plugged in in your living room, and that's probably where the, the HAL dot got there. Um, <laughs> any more questions? questions? Okay, one more question. Um, I, uh, maybe the previous two questions uh, address this, but what is the, at the interface level, what is your biggest challenge? Um, I would say this is more of a design problem than it is a, a GUI problem. Within the world of sleep apnea patients and people who wear CPAP masks, you have two very, very different kinds of users. One wants to get the scan done and have it just fit and just work. They don't want to touch anything. They want the process to be done. And so we want to be catered to that user while also catering to this polar opposite user that is a power nerd and they want to control every little thing, the nth degree. And it's the power nerd user that's a lot more passionate and vocal like on the message forums. And so like upsetting them in any way, shape, or form is bad. But at the same time, because you're designing for them, you don't want to alienate the, the, their whole opposite, which is somebody who wants to be a novice. So like how many levels of hierarchy do you vary controls in? Like at what stage in different parts of the curation do you allow certain things to become accessible and not accessible? what things do we make only accessible by the doctor and accessible to the patient. Um, we're still we're still prototyping to try to get to the, the bottom of some of those things. In reality, we'll never figure it out. It'll just change. And that's the beauty of these kinds of business processes. Is we can change it every single day. Like, not only does the map, no two maps be the same, be the same, the interface doesn't have to be consistent for the same. And so the product may, and from a software standpoint, start evolving into its own separate flavors. Because one sleep doctor wants to do it one way, and another sleep doctor might want to do it a different way. And that's fine. Wow, great presentation. Thank you.